Praise God. Welcome to all of you tonight. And as my wife said, to all the faithful folks, Brother Grossbach, I think, would call it the nucleus. Appreciate you being here. And if you're a guest tonight, we are thrilled to have you in service with us this evening. It's our hope and prayer that if it hasn't already happened, the presence of God would touch you, minister to you tonight. Those of you that may be watching us online, we welcome you from wherever you are as a part of this service tonight. I want to read uh, a couple of verses from two different passages. I don't usually do it quite that way, and but the first verse, actually, most of you probably could quote it with me tonight. And that is John chapter 1 and verse number 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When? When was that? In the the beginning of what? In the beginning of everything that we know. In the beginning of everything temporal. The Word was already there from the beginning. And then if you'd go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, which is another verse. Many of you probably can quote this verse. But Hebrews 11 and 1 says this, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, not by their good works, not by their perfection, not by their performance, by their faith, the elders obtained a good report. And then verse number three says this, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. So that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. We understand that the worlds were framed by the Word of God. This past week was the Maryland, D.C. District Men's Conference, and I was privileged to be one of the speakers on Friday morning. And in the course of that, I made what was really somewhat of a derogatory statement toward myself, at least in the context of the way it's normally used. But after it came out of my mouth, it was like in that moment I had a sudden change on what I had just said. And I hadn't been able to get away from that from since Friday morning. So my title tonight is this. And the first part of my title was the thing I said. I'm old-fashioned. What are you? I made the statement in the, along with my preaching that I was old-fashioned. Which, again, we usually, that's sort of a negative context. But I've come to tell you tonight, I am old-fashioned thank you father for your presence in this place tonight god you have moved in in such a wonderful powerful way we may not know the report in some situations god it may be such that it's personal it's private and we may never really hear but i believe based on what i have seen and what i have felt in my spirit that there are some people that have received a victory in this service tonight. They've received a touch from you that they came in this place in desperate need of. And I thank you for that, God. And I pray that now you would continue to work and minister in this service tonight and that you would do that through your word. Speak to us through your word. Give us ears to hear, hearts to receive what you would say to us tonight. I trust you tonight. I depend on you for your anointing, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. 
You may be seated. The writer says the worlds were framed by the Word. And John says, in the beginning was the Word. In Hebrews 11 and 3, the Greek word there for the English word, word, is actually the word rhema, which is the living voice. It's a living utterance. However, we know that there is no rhema that's truly from God that is not based on the Logos. In John 1, when it says, in the beginning was the Word, the Greek word there is the Logos. That's the written Word. That's the forever settled Word of God. And, and so we, 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 faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. And again, there the Word is rhema. That is a fresh living voice. But I will say it again. There is no such thing as a Word from God that will contradict the written Word. God will never tell you to do something contrary to His Word. <laughs> never going to happen. So the writer says that the worlds were framed by the Word. And I believe that your world, your personal world, is framed by the Word. The Amplified Bible says, verse number 3, this way, by faith we understand that the worlds during the successive ages were framed or they were fashioned, put in order and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God so that what we see was not made out of things which are visible. You can't be fashioned by anything older than the Word. You can't be formed by anything older than the Word. So I come to tell you tonight, I am gladly embracing that I am, and by the help of God, I'm always going to be old-fashioned. I'm not going to be new-fashioned. I'm not going to let the current ways of thinking in this modern world, both in the world and in the church, I'm not going to let that be what fashions me, but I'm going to embrace the fact I am fashioned by something very old, so I am old-fashioned. Oh, help me tonight, Jesus, to preach to some young people and some young adults that are being tempted to be new-fashioned, that there is no better way to live than by being old-fashioned. There is no new idea. There is no new concept. There is no new law. There is no new concept of morality that is a better way to be fashioned than by being old-fashioned. Old-fashioned, according to Webster's, is of or relating to or characteristic of a past era. Adhering to customs of a past era. I believe the things that Brother Hurt said last weekend, and he said in times past, and some of those things he said are almost quotes of things Bishop has said. I believe that our focus is not this building and our focus is not supposed to be Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Thursday night. But I'm just going to tell you, I'm old-fashioned. And while it may not be all that we do, it is an integral part of what we do. And I was old-fashioned and the old-fashioned way was when the doors of the house of God were open, unless you were sick or it was essentially an impossibility you were going to be there and I wasn't just going to be there I was glad when they said unto me let us go unto the house of the Lord 
Uh, I know a bunch of people aren't here tonight, but I'm going to preach what I feel anyway. I'm sick and tired of battling against this thing that says we ought to cancel church every slight opportunity and excuse we get. I'm old-fashioned, and let me tell you what happens when you're old-fashioned. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, and so much the more, not the less... I don't understand it. I can't comprehend it. Why is it that churches are cutting out activities? Why they're eliminating things? When the scripture says the closer we get to the end, the more we need to get together. And I acknowledge, I acknowledge that is not gathering together strictly in church services. But that's a part of it. I'll tell you what another part of it is. Next Sunday night. I don't understand people that would come to church next Sunday night, but since we're not having church and we're going to be fellowshipping, they're staying home. I question how much you're really a part of the body. Because when you're really a part of the body, again, unless there's some kind of issue that's unavoidable, every chance you've got to be with brothers and sisters that you can draw strength and give strength, you're going to be there. Oxford Dictionary says old-fashioned means this, in or according to styles or types, no longer current or common, not modern. Again, most of the time when something's referred to as being old-fashioned, it is in a negative context. But as I was speaking Friday morning and it really had nothing to do with what I was ministering about or it wasn't the main point, I finally, at 49 years old, I've been saying I'm almost 50, but I stopped that. I'm now milking every single chance to say 49. Brother Ellenberger was so kind the other day at men's conference He's a little late on this, but he was so kind to say, you do know you're in your 50th year. I am, but I'm not there yet. I got, I won't embarrass the parents by calling any names. But I had my gray barong on from the Philippines. This, by the way, we did have Philippine representation today. They were just taking care of food, so. I realize, I'm like, wait a minute, we missed the Philippines. Can't miss the Philippines. No offense to anybody, but I'm just going to tell you, the Filipinos are some of the sweetest, if not the sweetest spirited people in the world. And my shirt was basically gray. And I had a wonderful child tell me this morning how well my shirt matched my hair. Uh, (laughs) I felt bad for the parents, but really I took it. I mean, my own family's already thrown me under the bus too many times now, so that, uh, you know. (laughs) I've I've finally, I've fought it for years. I mean, because even in Brother Mott, even in my early 30s, I always felt old-fashioned. I always felt like what I preached and how I preached and what I believed was old-fashioned. I can't believe it's taken me all these years to finally figure out it is old-fashioned. It's not social media fashioned. Some of you won't have a clue what this is. Praise God. Don't go try to find out. It, my, 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 what I believe in preaching, and teaching, and how I live, it's not elevation-fashioned. It's not Hillsong fashion. It's not what some preacher who gets in an interview with Oprah Winfrey says fashion. It's old fashion. 
because it's fashioned by the Word, and the Word's been around from the beginning. The Word got around before modern-day politics, and the Word's been around before modern-day religious ideas, and so I am, and I sure hope I'm amongst a group of people that are willing to acknowledge I was, I am, and I will be old-fashioned. Jeremiah 18 and verse number 1, the Lord says to the prophet Isaiah, the word which came to, or excuse me, to Jeremiah, the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels, and the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter so he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it then the word of the Lord came to me saying O house of Israel cannot I do with you as this potter saith the Lord behold as the clay is in the potter's hand so are you in my hand O house of Israel you can say of a potter working a lump of clay that he is fashioning that lump into a vessel. You can call what he's doing fashioning. And so the Lord says to Jeremiah, I want you to watch the potter fashion that clay because as the potter does with the clay, that's how I do with my people. So can I tell you tonight that the hands of the potter are the oldest hands there are. I believe it's Daniel who says a term. There's a couple of times I think it's Daniel that uses it. It's all they're all three found, if I'm not mistaken, in the same chapter. But he uses the term the ancient of days. The ancient of days. You know what that basically means? Really old. One commentary says it means the everlasting father. So I come to tell you tonight, I am old fashioned because I want the potter. I want the potter, not just any potter. I want the potter to be what shapes me and molds me and forms me. I want to be old fashioned. Oh, I plead with some young people here this evening. You don't need to be TikTok fashioned. You don't need to be TikTok fashioned. You don't need to be Instagram fashioned. You don't need to be Snapchat fashioned. You don't need to be intellectually fashioned by the modern ideas of this world. But I've come to plead with some young people tonight. The only way to live, the only way to go is being old fashioned. It's by saying, thou art the potter, I am the clay. Shape me and mold me according to your will. Ancient, the ancient of you can't get any older than that. You can't get any older than that. I don't even know him to call him, and I'm proud to say that. I don't know if you ever can say proud in a any kind of a right context, but we try. So, so for all you really spiritual folks that, sorry, you know what I'm trying to say. I, I don't know. I, I can't even. I, if you held a gun to my head I, before God, I could not tell you who the most popular singers are right now. And God help you if you just said, well, I, I don't mean out loud. I mean in your heart. If you just said, well, I can. There's a lot more things to be proud of than that. I don't know them. I have no interest of knowing them. Because the little that I get a insight of every now and then when I'm in public places and it's on, I don't want any of that fashioning me. 
and when you let that in to your through your ears, when you choose to listen to that, you are letting it fashion you. I keep wanting to say I know I'm old-fashioned, but that's what I'm actually preaching tonight. I, 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 hope, that, I hope it doesn't go away, because I'm just telling you, since Friday morning, I've been stirred. Because to be honest, Brother Isaac, I've been, I've been intimidated for a little while about being old-fashioned. But what other way do you want to be fashioned? Oh, to all of you, young, especially you teenagers, if you can describe your parents as old-fashioned tonight, you are a blessed person. If you can describe the things your parents do in your household, the rules that they have as old-fashioned, you ought to be one of the biggest worshipers here because that's not a curse. That is a great blessing. Friday night, Brother... Cornwell, who was the night speaker and spoke yesterday at men's conference. Many of you know him. What a great man of God. And, and he preached his title Friday night. What, and he, he, I mean, he, he basically preached his title the last like 10 minutes of his message. He just, but his title was Five Reasons to Be a Christian. You know what the first one was? It's the best life. It's the best life. It's the best life. 29 years, it's the best life. I got nothing on my phone. I'm worried about her finding. I got nothing in my Facebook. I'm worried about her finding. That's the best life. Got nothing to hide. You know what, dads? All my kids, all four of my kids know the password to my phone. All four of them. All four of them could pick my phone at any time. Say, well, I ain't there. I'm never texting you because your kids, they're, they're not nosy. They don't go reading it. They usually never have my phone. But my point is, there ain't nothing to hide. You may not go that far. Oh, I'm going to meddle a little bit because I'm, I'm old-fashioned. <laughs> if you and your spouse don't have each other's passwords, you got a problem. And if you don't have anything to hide and you don't give it to them, you got a problem. Problem is, we got too much to hide nowadays because we're new fashioned. We've decided, you know what, there's, there, we don't have to really live that way. We, we don't, you know what, all that stuff that, you know, all that stuff that was preached years ago, it's just not necessary. The only reason you can say that is because you got new hands as your potter. You don't have the ancient of days that's shaping and molding you. You've got something new as your potter. I want you to watch him work because that's what I want to do. I want to shape you. I want to form you. I want to fashion you. Listen, listen to this passage in, in Jeremiah 6. You ought to go home tonight and read the first nine verses. and You may want to do that in another translation because it's just a little bit plainer English than the King James. But, but the Lord is he's speaking to His own people. He's not speaking to the, to the reprobates and the sinners. He's not speaking to the ungodly. He's talking to his own people. And the first nine verses lay that out very clearly. And then in verse number 10, listen, listen to what the Lord says. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? 
Do do, do you hear that question? Who am I going to talk to? And who am I going to give warning to that will hear me? Behold, their ear is uncircumcised and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have not, they have no delight. And I think pretty much everyone can get the idea that this is a very negative thing. But you may be going, okay, what in the world is an uncircumcised ear? So listen to the Amplified and the Message Bible, which make it pretty clear. Again, the context here is he's speaking to his people. He's talking to his people. The Amplified, to whom shall I, or Jeremiah, speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ears are uncircumcised, never brought into covenant with God or consecrated to His service. And they cannot hear or obey. Behold, the word of the Lord has become to them a reproach and the object of their scorn. They have no delight in it. Can we get the Amplified up there? Do we have that readily accessible? I don't see anyone up there, so I don't... Ah, there we go. I want you to. I want you to look at this. This is a. This is a different version of the Amplified. There's a couple of Amplified, the Amplified Classic, and some. So it's a little bit different than the one I have here, but it's still the Amplified. To whom shall I, Jeremiah, speak? Give warning that they may hear. Behold, their ears are closed, absolutely deaf to God, and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reprimand and an object of scorn to them. They have no delight in it. There he goes again. There goes the preacher again. There goes Pastor Wright again. Harping on the heart. There he goes again. Jeremiah says, who am I going to talk to? Who can I give a warning to that will listen? The Message Bible says it this way. I've got something to say. Is anybody listening? I have a warning to post. Will anyone notice? Listen listen to what he's, uh, the message Bible way of what he says. It's hopeless. Their ears are stuffed with wax, deaf as a post, blind as a bat. It's hopeless. They've tuned out God. They don't want to hear from God. We all sit here and go, yeah, we know that's the world. No! He's talking to his people. He's talking to the people that he ought to be able to give warning to and they won't listen. The people that he sent To preach to that God is trying to reach. I I, I didn't come to focus on the youth tonight. I was not in my Here I go again. Some of you young people in this place tonight. That maybe not necessarily tonight or tomorrow. But some of you, your souls are hanging in the balance. Because you're letting new things, new in the context of compared to this, you're letting new things influence your way of thinking. You're letting new things shape your beliefs. You're letting new things determine your actions. There is nothing else worth being fashioned by than the Word of God. That's such a restrictive way to live. That's such a hard way to live. Really? I'm not worried about trying to figure out how I'm going to get my next fix. We, we, we live in a, in, a, in, a, in a decent 
neighborhood. It's not a wealthy neighborhood by any stretch. It's, it's kind of, I think, somewhere kind of in the middle. And, and we got it. We got an email to the community email a couple of weeks ago because a lady in our neighborhood living inside, I don't know what they name the color of the house, but I don't even know which house it was. But a lady living in our neighborhood, they had to call the cops on her because she was breaking into houses because she's addicted to meth and she's trying to find something to get money to be able to sell. To get the next fix. One of the biggest lies of the enemy that he tries to sell every one of us is, well, you can handle it. You can handle it. Let me tell you something. <laughs> you aren't going to be the first that can play with fire and not get burned. I've used this before. I used it Friday morning because it's fresh and new. We were part of our vacation was in Yosemite. Absolutely. If you ever have a chance to go to Yosemite, I recommend it. I don't know what the rest of my family thinks, but I recommend it. One of the most beautiful places I've ever visited. One of the things that's common there is just granite rock walls. One of them is El Capitan, which is, for rock climbers, one of the most famous spots to try to climb. If you've ever seen it, if you haven't seen it, it's worth a watch. It's called Free Solo. It's a documentary about a guy. El Capitan is 3,200 feet, right? I think 3,200 feet. This guy, without any kind of safety, no, no ropes, no nothing. Free Solo is he climbed it free. I still can't decide if I respect that. Or if I think he's just got to be a total idiot. And probably somewhere in the middle. We went to a couple of spots, a couple of overlooks, scenic spots. One of them is a little path to walk up. It's called Glacier Point in, in uh, Yosemite. And it's got a great, another notable landmark in Yosemite. It's called Half Dome. And so from Glacier Point, there's a really great uh, uh, view of half dome and you walk up there and, and you get up to the to the edge of it and it's it's probably I, I think a thousand foot or more drop off and they got a wall around the perimeter and then along that wall the wall is probably about three or four feet high and then on that wall there's a railing that's attached to that wall three of my four kids I really thought all four of them were brilliant. <laughs> I'm second guessing that. Because three of them, for some reason, the view from behind the wall was not good enough. They had to put their legs in between the wall and the rail and sit with their feet dangling over. Somehow that was a better picture. My wife expresses it. I just, because I'm the man, I keep it internalized, but it drives me nuts. I can't enjoy the scenery for thinking about I'm about to see them for the last time. We did another hike. It was my boys and my dad and I up to this waterfall, and you get up to it, and, uh, and, and it's, it's a several, probably several hundred foot drop off. Same thing, railing around the perimeter of it. Uh, the, my boys had got one of the most strenuous things I've ever personally done. You might do it with no problem, but I, it, it, was, it, was, it was wearing me out. <laughs> and I finally caught up to my sons they were on the they were they they beat me up there and I get up there and and kind of at this point right near the waterfall same thing wall rail but not good enough except this time just past the rail was some with a little rock formation and the first thing I spot is Nathaniel standing over past the rail on the rock leaning with his camera and then, as I glance to the side of that, I see the other son who's climbing over the wall, heading to a similar spot so he can sit and dangle his feet. They've never done drugs, but something's fried some brain cells. <laughs> I 
But you see, when it comes to that setting, I, I have this philosophy. I'm, 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 I know I preached this before. You probably don't remember, so I shouldn't tell you that. You'll think it's all brand new. You know what? I'm, I'm, I'm bold stuff right here. Woo, yeah. Why? Why? Because my thoughts is, y'all, come on, y'all weren't here last week, come on. Reason I'm good with that is because I'm okay. I know that at 49, there is still the chance. But for the most part, I'm pretty sure I can handle it. I was watching, I, I watched that free solo. I watched, I mentioned this before. I watched, uh, y'all in a hurry? Good, because I'm not. I, I watched it. I was watching in, in some downtime last year, uh, watching some Red Bull stuff, Red Bull TV. And I mean, they're crazy. They're crazy. Like, like that, I've already, these guys climbing these mountains and all this skydiving and all that. And in the middle of watching all that, I, I got up on my roof. <laughs> my back, I mean, the back roof, it's probably like, 10, I don't know, 10 feet, that back roof. I get up there to paint a section of it. And I'm like laying down, grabbing part of a roof with one hand and the brush in the other hand trying and my heart's racing 90 miles an hour because there's a 10 foot drop. If that's what it takes to be a man, I got no hope. But I, 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 I've learned something and the reason I'm not climbing up on the edge is there's always a chance that I might fall. And when I fall, I don't want to be dangling over the edge. Because if I'm living on the edge, when I fall, there's no room. But if I'll keep some space between me and the edge, when I fall, I've got room to fall and I've got room to get back up. God have mercy why we want to try to find out where the line is on everything and live as close to the edge as we can. You are going to fall. You're going to make mistakes. And so give yourself some space that when you fall, you're not up on the wall and it's over the edge you go. I know. <laughs> I, keep, I keep saying it, and, and I'm still thinking in the old terms, but I keep saying it. I'm going to change my thinking if, even if you don't change you. I know what we teach here, that it's good for a man not to touch a woman. I know that's old-fashioned. It is old-fashioned because it came from the Word of God. And if you're not married, you got no business touching. Now let's talk, let's let's just be honest. How stupid does that sound in 2021? How ridiculous is that in 2021 when you got movies and shows on Disney with 12 and 13 year olds making out? Preacher, you're gonna tell us if we're not married, we should. Yes. Because I'm old fashioned. So you be new fashioned if you want, but I'm going to stick with the old fashioned ways. It's hopeless. They've turned out God. They don't want to hear from God. Verse 11, King James, therefore I am full 
of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken the age with him that is full of days. And their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, even everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people, slightly saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Our problem is not the government. America's problem didn't come from the government. America's problem didn't come from the education system. America's problem came, some of you may not like this, but America's problem came from the pulpit. Because for decades now, the pulpit has become more and more new-fashioned. If you miss what I'm saying, I'm not talking about the piece of furniture. I'm talking figuratively about where a man or woman of God preaches from. The pulpit has become watered down. The Lord said to the prophet Ezekiel, I got a problem with my priests. Not with Hollywood. Not with politics, not with education. I got a problem with my priests because they have put no difference between the clean and the unclean, between the holy and the profane. I don't mean to be unkind, but if you want a new fashion church, they're a dime a dozen. You can go to one in person, and there's a lot of them you can go to online. But as for this house, and I know I'm not by myself in here, but we've made up our minds old-fashioned we were old-fashioned we are and old-fashioned we will be sin is still sin i believe in repentance i believe in forgiveness but the problem is we've got new synonyms I don't know if it'll happen or not, but I, I, I've been feeling maybe at some point in the next several weeks or so, the Lord, even if it's just one night, would let me preach a little bit on repentance. Because we, apostolics, have a misconception of repentance. Because for too many of us, repentance is nothing more than a My bad. My bad, God. I I know I messed up. My bad. You mess up, make a mistake, you say that to somebody, that's not my bad. I I don't know when it started. I don't remember. I don't remember it was around since I was a kid, but I've done it myself playing sports. Throw a bad pass. Or somebody throws a pass to you on the basketball court and you drop it. My bad. Okay, so what? Repentance is not my bad. God's not your homie. And I put this on Facebook and Instagram, and for those of you that aren't on them, I'll just go ahead and say it from this pulpit. God is not dope. What in the world have we come to that we need to say God's dope as some way of describing how good or cool God is? I got a question to you adults here tonight. How many of you, when you hear the word dope, you think cool? How many of you, when you hear the word dope, you think drugs? Or an idiot? He's a dope. But because somebody is redefining a term. I've seen that t-shirt several times and I had enough of it. And then, man, never, whatever. 
God is not dope. God's not my homie. I, well, I'll, I'll get on another one. This might be some of your favorite song. This stuff about, how, how do, I don't even, somebody have to help me. And just because you can help me doesn't mean you like it, okay? So all y'all going to be silent on me. What, uh, God, he's a man of his word. What, how does it? He's a man of his word. You're a, yeah, you're a man of your word. You're a man of your word. I know the scripture says he's not a man that he should lie. But in the context of that, you're talking about God. God is a spirit, not a man. Why we need some cute little modern day terminology to talk about the ancient of days. I got some things you can describe him as. He's the almighty God. The everlasting father. He's the prince of peace. He's the first and the last. He's the beginning and the ending. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He was. He is. He is to come. He is the shepherd. He is the savior. He is the healer. He is the deliverer. He is awesome. He is amazing. Brother, right? You know, just the young folks. Yeah? The young folks. I've said it again before. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to keep saying it. The young folks may be smart, but they are not wise. And we should not dumb down what the Word of God says. Oh, hallelujah. We had a great morning this morning, didn't we? Woo! Hallelujah. Peace, peace when there is no peace. Were they, listen, listen to this, were they ashamed when they committed abomination? Because, I, 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 don't, I, I guess I didn't finish the point. Repentance is not an, also repentance is not simply an apology. And the problem is, not the first time when we got saved. But I think we get into a habit of apologizing and not repenting. Because repentance is not simply, God, I'm sorry for what I did. Repentance is a change of mind. It is a change of direction. And so if you have repented over your sin, but you have not decided to think differently about it, you have not repented. If you've repented, but said or think, well, if I could do it again, I'd do it again. You have not repented. You have not repented. You may have apologized. You have not repented. Because repentance is a change. David, when confronted by Nathan the prophet over his sin with Bathsheba, made a statement that all of us need to learn. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. And I have sinned. He said, I've done this evil in your sight. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they weren't ashamed at all. Neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fail, that, that fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. They do wrong and they don't even feel bad about it. They don't even blush over it. Not even embarrassed by it. Why? Because they've desensitized themselves. I think I said this recently in a service. I don't remember if it was a Sunday or a Thursday, but I was, I was re-watching the Conquer series, which is the DVD series um, about overcoming 
pornography, and, and this is my pride telling this, but I just want to say it. I wasn't re-watching it because I needed it. It's not beyond some of you to think, oh, I wonder why he was watching it again. But I, I know, I know, biblically I know that when you consistently disregard your conscience, you can desensitize your conscience. But what I didn't read, and I missed it the first time, we watched it together several years ago, but I caught it this time, scientifically, Scientifically, when you go against your conscience, your brain rewires. So while it is a spiritual thing, there is also a physical effect. The fact that you now do what you used to do and felt bad about it but don't feel bad about it anymore, it's not because you've been enlightened, it's because you've been desensitized. It's what happens when a person walks away from God. They stop feeling guilty and they'll, boy, I've been set free. Some of you may have read it and if you haven't, you can go back there, but somebody commented on my post. That's the problem with you people. There you, somebody's trying to sort of say something good about God and you're calling them out on that. And they said, that's why I'm glad I'm not one of you anymore. You better be careful when you're lit, listening to those that God has set free. When they've come to see the light that what we as apostolics believe is not necessary anymore. I, 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 had, I had an individual on, contact me several years ago. And, and, man, they were giving me the what for because they got family members in this church that haven't talked to them in years. And then you, you, how dare you let them be, how dare you let them be leaders, blah, blah, blah. And, and I'm like, and this was a couple years ago, and then a little while after that, one day I'm scrolling Facebook, and they had a profanity-laced post. I mean, F-bomb and everything. I never said this to anybody else. I didn't say it out loud, but I thought it, and you don't know who it is, so I'm going to say it. I thought, you hypocrite. You're going to ream them out and then do that and not think twice about it. Why? Because you've rewired some things. No, you're not enlightened. No, you're not set free. You've rewired some things. They don't even blush anymore. But after all of that, verse 16, thus saith the Lord. Oh God, let this be somebody's prayer tonight. Stand ye in the ways and see and ask, ask for the old paths where is the good way and walk therein and you will find rest for your souls but they said we will not walk therein message bible says that verse this way god's message yet again go stand at the crossroads and look around ask for directions to the old road the tried and true road then take it Discover the right route for your souls. But they said, nothing doing. We aren't going that way. Stand at the crossroads. Stand at the point at which you've got to make a decision which way you're going to go. And ask, give me the old paths. Show me where the old paths are. I don't want some new path that promises some great outcome that cannot make good on its promise. Give me the old paths. I close. Is that really not what Moses was saying? Forty 
years, 40 years being raised in Egypt by the Egyptians, which represents the world. 40 years of living in Pharaoh's household, having the best that Egypt could offer. No doubt he wore the best of clothes, ate the best of foods, was educated by the most well-educated people in the nation. He had everything you could ask for and more. And he reaches a point where he's come to the crossroads. And now he's got to make a decision. And when you really look at it, in a lot of ways, you would say, what choice is there? I mean, you put down Baskin Robbins mint chocolate chip ice cream. Not any other kind of mint chocolate chip, just Baskin Robbins. And then you put down some yogurt. There is nothing to choose. Nothing to decide. I mean, you plop down a greasy, cheese-covered lettuce, tomato, ketchup, mustard, burger, and some veggie patty. What's the choice? Ain't nothing to decide. (laughs) Moses, one side is bondage. One side is a people who are living in oppression. The other side is everything he's already known. The best of Egypt. But Hebrews chapter 11, a little further down where we read from the beginning. The Bible says when he was come to years. He chose to suffer reproach with the people of God. Rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Because he esteemed the reproach of Christ greater riches than all Egypt had to offer. And the reason was he understood that they may be in this condition right now where things are bad. And the Egyptians may be in a position right now where things are good. But what I'm really interested in is what's the outcome. And by the grace of God, he realized that while the Egyptians were in a great place right now, that's not what their future was going to be. And while the Israelites were in a bad place right now, that's not what their future was going to be. One of the biggest mistakes, here I go again on the youth and young adults, but one of the biggest mistakes made by youth is to make decisions that will impact your future based on the moment. How many adults could raise your hand? I'm not going to ask you what it is, and you're not going to have to say, so it's as bad, as generic as I can make it. But how many adults in here have decisions that you made as a teenager that if you would have understood at that point the impact that decision would have made on the rest of your life, you would have... Keep your hands up, please. If you're in your teens and early 20s, please look around for a moment. Please look around for a moment. Because if you choose to make your decisions about your future based on the moment you're in, 20, 30, 40 years from now, if Jesus doesn't come, you're going to raise your hand and say, I made choices then that I've had to live with since then. Let me, let me just insert and remind you, does God forgive? Yes. Will God forgive you no matter what you've done? Yes, He will. But forgiveness is not synonymous with all of the consequences being wiped away. 
not trying to heap guilt and shame on anybody right now. I'm not trying to do that, but I am trying to appeal to somebody right now. I've told, I, I, I'm trying to quit. I really am. I, I've, I've told this before. I'm going to tell it again. I've been born and raised in church. And in this all my life, I am far from perfect. I've never, literally never drank one drop of alcohol. Literally have never smoked one cigarette. Have never tried any illicit, illegal drugs. Never. I'm just as much as a sinner as all of you that did that stuff. I'm no less a sinner in need of a Savior. So please hear me. I was a virgin when we got married. But I've got some friends. I got some friends that were raised like me in a preacher's home. Their dad was a pastor. And in their teen years, some of them late teens, even into their early 20s, they, they backslid and walked away from God for a while. Lived their life, had all kinds of fun, did all kinds of, uh, they slept around, drank, whatever else, got, did, did it all. And finally prayed back through and several of them are now preachers just like they're, they're now pastors. Years ago, it was in a meat meeting. <laughs> in fact, it was a youth meet meeting. And I gotta, I'm going to be transparent with you. I got to looking at some of those guys and thinking, in my 20s thinking, as a married man thinking, you know what, I, I really, I blew it. I blew it because I stayed in church all that time. That was, that was, I, hang on, hang on. I, I hear some of you. Oh, I know. I thought, man, you know what? I could have, I didn't have to be a virgin when I got married. I'd have been all right. I didn't have to have my first kiss on my wedding day. pausing because I'm suppressing I, I mean I could have tried a drink or two and, and before I'm not making this up before God there were times in which that was my I was thinking that but all that changed at that meat meeting because one of the guys that was minister in that meeting was one of the guys like what I'm talking about. He had been born and raised, he wasn't born and raised in the home of a preacher, but he was born and raised in the home of, a, of an apostolic family, a praying mother. And he got to his late teen years and he started doing all that stuff and spent several years doing all that stuff and then finally prayed back through Got his life on track in the ministry, pastoring, working in the kingdom of God. But as he stood there that day, ministering to that group, he was talking about the times in which he struggles having to work through all of that stuff all over again. In the middle of trying to minister and preach and pastor and whatever and all of a sudden that stuff comes rushing back and once again he's got to work through all of it and he did and he would all of a sudden I realized maybe I could have had my fun and done that stuff and prayed back through and still been in ministry but it's a wonderful thing. I got plenty of stuff that I still have to pray. Please hear me. I'm not in any way trying to propose to you that I am perfect. Far from it. But with regards to that, I am thankful that I didn't have my fling 
God have mercy on any of you parents that have the mindset, well, you know, I have my fun. My kids deserve to have theirs. You know what? I agree absolutely they deserve to have fun. But it ought to be old-fashioned fun. It ought to be the kind of fun that when you get done having that fun and you lay down on your bed at night, you can think back over that fun without feelings of guilt and condemnation. You can think back over that and think how wonderful it was and and feel good about yourself. Ask for the old paths. Ask for the old paths. Some of you got peers you're listening to. I'm going to get pretty plain with you right now. Some of you got people that used to be a part of this church and still apparently are apostolic, but they, they, they dress different ways now and they do different things and seems like everything's okay. And they may be going to heaven. If you're not careful, you'll start going, you know what, maybe, I'm just going to say it, maybe it's okay to walk in some new paths and still get there. But you know what, I'm not willing to risk my soul. I'm not willing to try to figure out how close to the edge can I live and still be saved. How close to the cliff can I live and still get to heaven. You see, the Bible says that the righteous are scarcely saved. Not one of us is going to go strolling into heaven. know how I think most of us are going to get into heaven it's been a long road (laughs) I've fallen a lot of times I've made a lot of mistakes but I've tried to stay on this old path because I've been told where this old path leads and so I've stuck with the old paths and by the grace of God I'm going to hear him say well done thou good and faithful servant not because I had it all together not because I was so good at it but because I made up my mind give me the old path give me the old path the new path may be easier the new path may be paved the new path may have all kind of amenities but I want the old path would you bow your heads and close your eyes and I just feel like not everybody may need to do this and if you don't do this that's not a negative but there are some people in this place right now that I'm challenging you to get up out of your seat and make your way down to this altar and ask God again oh God give me the old paths give me the old paths I want to walk in the old paths I want to be old fashioned fashioned by the word fashioned by your hands I want to be old fashioned I don't want to be new fashioned God I don't want to be fashioned by new ideas, new concept, new ideology. I I don't want to be fashioned by humanistic thinking. I don't want to be fashioned by modern thinking. I want to be fashioned by the Word. Oh, help us tonight, Holy Ghost. Give us the old paths. Give us the old paths. Give us the old paths that know they may not always be easy to walk, but where they're leading is sure worth it. They may not always be convenient to walk, but where they're taking me is worth every trouble, every trial, every struggle. Every bit of effort I may have to put forth to climb that old path. When I hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, every struggle, every difficulty is all going to fade away. Oh, 
Oh God, there's a lot of new things trying to fashion us. There's a lot of new things trying to shape us. There's a lot of new ideas trying to mold our lives. Not just in the world, but they're in the church, Lord. There's some things in the church that are trying to fashion us in a new way. Oh God, give us the old paths. Give us the old paths. Give us the old paths. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I wonder if I could appeal to some elders in this place that have been walking that old path. I wonder if I could appeal to some elders that have been faithfully walking to those old walking that old path to find a younger person and lay your hand on them and pray for them that God would give them the grace and the strength to walk in the old paths. I don't mean young just as in children. I mean young as in teenagers and young adults, maybe even some young married couples that some of you elders would just put a hand on their shoulder and pray that God would give them the grace and the strength to walk in those old paths. I want the hands of the Ancient of Days to shape me. I want the hands of the Ancient of Days to be my potter. I want the Ancient of Days to be what shapes my life. I don't want some new way. I don't want some new idea. I don't want some new method. I don't want some new fancy gimmick. Give me a love so strong that I will not be moved. I will not be moved. Because you are the truth. You mean more to me than words could ever say. So I promise, Lord. going to walk away, God. Never walk away. I'm not going to give in to the temptation to walk away. I want the old paths. I want the old paths. I want the old paths. I want the old paths, God. I want to walk in the old paths. I want to be old fashioned. I want to be old fashioned. Elamando robo se ye alala baki ando robo shatala baaya. So I promise, Lord. Ay alala bo se ki ye ando robo kori alala baaya. The name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Oh, 